in, 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 the, uh, in the sense of uh, empirical work, that ideally you would need a bunch of people who are similar, and then you would want some of them to be hit by a particular shock, which could be a positive shock or a negative shock. And then you want to uh, look at their transition behavior over time and then try to figure out what is happening to that. Because otherwise, if somebody is saving up a lot and then eventually getting out of poverty, that could well be that that person is dynamic and would have kind of done that anyway and should not be compared with others who are uh, less forward looking or have a lower saving rate. So this is a very kind of basic problem, right? And that is why uh, compelling evidence on this is hard to find, right? Now, one of the things I would like to do here is first give a bit of a theoretical outline in terms of how, uh, how uh, we would want to think about uh, this poverty trap view in contrast to the uh, kind of more uh, standard convergence or the growth theory view where poverty would be a transient state. So it'll be a kind of bit of a, a theoretical uh, uh, kind of conceptual framework uh, that sets our mind to the empirical work. But after that, I will uh, move straight to the empirical work because that is uh, what uh, this paper is really adding mainly to the literature. So, this is a standard figure that uh, uh, all of you have seen uh, in economic growth um, a context that we basically have KT is on the horizontal axis, KT plus one on the vertical axis. So these are all, um, you know, some measure of capital, physical, financial, human capital. Here, mostly I'll be taking physical capital uh, as the interpretation, uh, which is relevant to the context. And this uh, transition equation is really gives us a mapping from initial capital to next period's capital. So this is exactly the kind of accumulation behavior, which in a dynamic setting, you know, you, whether it's the solo model, your classical growth model, you have some kind of transition equation that comes from the capital accumulation dynamic problem, right? So the question, what I said in kind of verbally, uh, can now be mapped to this diagram, namely, suppose we two, see two individuals, L and H. This is what we are observing at any given point in time. How do we know that their underlying transition equations are different? And that's why this person is you know, at a higher level and this person is at a lower level. Versus, what about this situation where the underlying transition equation is the same, but it is not one that displays the kind of smooth and, 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 and kind of concave uh, shape that would imply a convergence. Rather, it has non-convexities. Here I have drawn a particular version a shape form, but this could take many other forms as well. And uh, how do we not know that whether this is the case where L is here and H is here, and if L is given a bit of a push, uh, then essentially a positive accumulation cycle will take over and this person will eventually go to H. So this is a very canonical uh, figure of uh, any kind of poverty trap setting. And I'm here applying it to the uh, context of uh, sort of capital accumulation. But as you uh, all well know, there are many other settings in which this can be done, including macroeconomics, you know, low level versus high level of economic activity, search models, uh, nutrition and productivity, all sorts of different settings in which a similar kind of dynamic uh, dynamics could be at work. So as I said that the problem with observational data is accumulation of capital is endogenous to individual characteristics and circumstances. And so even if we have a panel, it will be driven by shocks that are correlated with individual characteristics and circumstances. And so movements around L and H cannot be used to identify. So ideally, as I said, now mapping into this particular diagram, if we could find a number of people say here and then uh, see whether there are some of them are moving here, some of them are moving here because they arbitrarily fell short of this uh, threshold for an unstable steady state. As you know that there are three steady states in this diagram. This is a stable one, this is a stable one, and this is an unstable one, right? Then we would be getting somewhere. But the trouble is, and this is again a very kind of basic, but subtle and important conceptual issue. In reality, you're not going to observe too many people who are around this point. Why? Because by definition, it's an unstable uh, steady state. 
So think about this way. So think about a physical analogy. So suppose there is a slide, right? Sort of a curved slide like you see in playgrounds, right? So if you see a bunch of kids on top and you see a bunch of kids on bottom, right? And then you're wondering, you know, why are the kids on top versus why are the kids on the bottom? Ideally, what you want to see is people, kids who are exactly at the cusp point here and then see who are the ones who are falling and who are the ones who are, you know, going, going, going up, right? So here, the trouble is by its very nature, this point is not gonna be stable. So in general, you're gonna observe a bimodal distribution of some folks who are bundled here, some folks who are kind of bunched around here, and then you have the basic problem, okay? So this is really the core problem that in some ways makes uh, identifying any kind of poverty traps hard. Okay, so what we do here, and now I want to come to the empirical setting and how we approach this problem is essentially what we do, and I will talk about the empirical setting in detail for uh, most of the rest of the talk. Essentially, what we are gonna do is exploit a particular randomized control trial that my colleagues uh, and co-authors on this paper, Oriana Bandier and Robin Burgess carried out in their long-term study with uh, BRAC, which is an NGO in Bangladesh, the one of the largest in the world and their ultra poor program, which basically gave a number, uh, a large uh, sample of rural women in Bangladesh, uh, a kind of uh, capital stock, right? A big capital stock, that's their ultra poor program. And then there was a, that was the treatment group and there was a corresponding control group. And essentially the uh, whole um, uh, kind of exercise was try to figure out whether for the very, you know, extreme poor, uh, maybe for those whom uh, microfinance or other kinds of anti-poverty programs are not sufficient to bring them out of poverty, whether you actually need a shock in the capital stock to bring them uh, above um, a certain threshold level. So what we basically do in this paper is uh, look at uh, essentially uh, individuals uh, who were initially, you know, there was a baseline survey where we can track how much capital they had. And then everybody is receiving a similar size capital injection. And then we want to test that those whose initial capital was less than a certain threshold, are they more likely to fall back to their original level? And those who had capital which was slightly larger than the initial level, uh, threshold level, are they more likely to uh, go above, right? And that is gonna be uh, the core idea behind our test. So here I just use a diagram to illustrate this. So as you can see that if this was a kind of more standard convergence type framework, then initially you would have a number of people who are distributed on the uh, X axis, KT, you know, the initial capital. Consider somebody who's here, K0A. If you give this person capital delta, which is the capital transfer, then that will put this person here and the next period he will be accumulated uh, more capital and this would eventually get this person up to the steady state. Whereas if you take somebody who has more than the steady state and you give this person extra capital, as you know by the standard logic of these models, this person will decumulate and eventually fall uh, um, back to the original position. So this kind of gives us, if we put K0 on the horizontal axis and uh, delta one, which is just defined to be your KT plus one minus KT, namely whatever your extra accumulation, the incremental accumulation, as you can see that this is the point at which it will intersect the zero axis, right? So if your K star minus delta, then having delta, you will exactly uh, not change your behavior because you have just hit the steady state. If you had more, then you're gonna decumulate. If you had less, you're more likely to accumulate. Contrast the same story, but now with a S-shaped uh, transition equation, right? And if there is a, uh, you know, uh, if we carry out a similar thought experiment, now you can see, suppose take somebody who has initially very little capital and then consider somebody who initially had relatively high amounts of capital and suppose somebody who had intermediate levels of capital. Now we can see that for the very poor, there will be actually decumulation because you are not getting enough and therefore you're gonna go back to the steady state, uh, the low steady state. Now for this person though, is close enough to the threshold, then having an extra capital would lead to positive accumulation behavior, which would then taper off uh, at this point. And of course, if you had lots of capital, then if you have extra capital, it will decumulate. 
Okay, so if you actually mapped K0 and delta 1 uh, in this particular setting, we can see that there is going to be a non monotonic relationship between uh, K0 and your accumulation behavior, which is in contrast with the uh, monotonic behavior around the steady state, which was negative in the previous case. Okay. And this is exactly our theoretical framework. And this is the point at which I would now make a transition to how we go about to uh, uh, testing this in an empirical setting. Okay, uh, I will pause here for a second in case there are any clarifying questions about the terminology uh, or, or, or any of the things that I said so far. But as uh, was agreed at the beginning, more substantive uh, questions uh, can be taken up in the Q&A session. Okay, so I will now go to the empirical setting and what we do in this paper. So we use the randomized control trial of a large asset transfer program in Bangladesh to implement a direct test. Uh, I will not talk about the structural estimation and things we do about occupational choice. That's for, um, um, you know, that you can look at the paper for those details. So let me talk a bit about the setting and then I will go straight to the test, okay? Uh, Shonok, if you could give me an alert at about five minutes before uh, the allocated time of 40 minutes, then that'll be great. Sure, okay. sure, sure. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is uh, describe a little bit of the setting here, because that's important in our interpretation. So basically, this is the BRACs uh, uh, targeting the ultra poor program in Northern Bangladesh, right? And there's an earlier paper that uh, my co-authors uh, studied where they look at the average effect of this program as opposed to the dynamic accumulation behavior, which is a test of the poverty trap model that we carry out in this paper. So the data covers about 21K households of which over 6,000 are extremely poor, okay? And that is def uh, defined in terms of ex-ante asset uh, classification thresholds, right? If you have certain assets below a threshold, then you're labeled extremely poor, otherwise nearly poor, et cetera, et cetera. Now, these are about 1,300 villages in the 13 poorest districts in the country. And the poorest women in randomly chosen villages receive an asset with some training, okay? And this asset typically, the modal asset choice that the women uh, made was basically cow, cow, like livestock, because that is the most desired uh, asset in this particular setting um, up to a certain level. After that, it becomes land. Okay, so these transfers, I will mention the sums here, were basically good enough for getting, getting a cow, and that is the kind of dairy farming uh, was uh, kind of very small scale dairy farming is what these women do. So this program offers a one-off transfer of productive assets and training with the aim of simultaneously relaxing credit and skill constraints to create a source of regular earnings for these poor women who are mostly engaged in irregular and insecure casual labor which is mostly agricultural labor as well as uh, domestic services. Not very different in, uh, compared to many other Indian settings we can think about. So beneficiaries are offered to choose from uh, several asset bundles, all of which are valued around 560 US dollars in per, uh, purchasing power parity terms uh, or 10,000 Bangladeshi taka in 2007 when this uh, evaluation, uh, uh, this whole exercise started and can be used for income generating activities. 3000 was the treatment group and 3000 was the control group, which is very helpful given what we have in mind, okay? 90% plus women chose an asset bundle containing a cow. BRAC encourages respondents to retain the asset for at least two years after which they can liquidate it, okay? So to identify the beneficiaries, BRAC runs a participatory wealth assessment exercise in every village. Uh, and this kind of gets us the various classifications. The ultra poor households who account for 6% of the population, and that's a population estimate, are eligible to receive the program and other households are ineligible. And the physical assets that of these women that, uh, that are uh, surveyed and measured are productive assets, which include poultry, livestock, tools, machines, vehicles, and land, and all converted in money values. 
So this was done in several rounds. So the baseline survey was conducted before the intervention in 2007. Two follow-up surveys with the full sample were done in 2009 and 2011, and two further survey rounds were done in 2014 and 2018 that collected data on households eligible for the programs. So what are some of the stylized facts before we get into uh, our uh, the main part of our analysis? Well, the stylized facts are as follows. Even through this long period through which the poor are, are, are kind of tracked, the poor tend to stay poor, left to their own devices. And how do we know this? Because we are tracking the control group, right? Hierarchy of jobs correlated with community-defined poverty. In particular, those who are asset poor tend to be employed in agriculture and domestic service. The richer among those are self-employed in livestock rearing and land cultivation. And moreover, the productive assets sets rich and poor apart. So the relatively rich in these villages, asset rich, are 94 times higher asset holdings than the relatively poor. The richer households own more expensive and indivisible assets, okay? Wage labor is uncertain, seasonal, and pays less per hour. And therefore, anybody who should be able to afford the assets and get into some of the self-employment activities would be, uh, uh, would be, uh, should be wanting to do that. And that's where our uh, theory that it is possibly the indivisibility and the lack of ownership up to a certain threshold that is constraining this one. Okay. So I've already said some of this, so I'll, I'll uh, skip some of uh, the details here, right? And, and, and uh, these are some of the details about how uh, these uh, surveys were ca carried out on the various rounds. So this is an important and interesting figure to look at because you have log of productive assets on the horizontal axis, right? And it's a probability density function that is estimated. So the treatment group is indicated by the red and the dashed line is the control group, right? I'm sorry, I, I, yeah, no, I, that is exactly correct. So the dashed blue line is the control group and the red one is the treatment group. And the size of the asset transfer in the scale essentially pulled a bunch of people from uh, this point uh, to about this point. And this is where you can see the bulge is that after the uh, treatment, a bunch of people were thrown into around this kind of you know, threshold, right? And that's where you see the change in this. Okay. So uh, Maitresh, uh, what does this trimodal distribution uh, 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 signify? I mean, the one in the lower strata would mean the one who, uh, who did not gain or, uh, what does these? Uh, uh, so uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So sure, sure. So much. Just to be clear about the diagram. Yeah. The dashed blue line are the control, right? Okay. And for the period we are studying, nothing is happening to them. They are just they are just being tracked. Okay, that's why they are a control group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's therefore focus just on the treatment group, which is the red, right? So in the red, what you have is an initial distribution, right? right? Yeah. And that is something we just take as given. If I did a survey of the audience member today, right now, right? I will observe some distribution, right? And I'm just describing empirically that that happens to be this particular one if we just focus on the red one, yeah? All right. But now, if you look at the intervention, so suppose in the current audience, I give half of them uh, the capital transfer and other uh, I don't, then essentially what happens is uh, there's a change in, in, in those who were initially you know, having this distribution. Now some of them have moved here. Is that clear? All right, right, right. So I'm just thinking, uh, thinking aloud, say... Uh, show me, I would, yeah, if yeah, it's yeah. a clarifying question, let's do it because otherwise I haven't come to the main all thing, right, but if it's right, a terminological right. clarification, that is uh, something to be clarified yeah. now. Otherwise, yeah. I would prefer not to um, have Pretty more open-ended discussions. Uh, sure, which sure, I sure, sure. For the Q &A. All right. But if it's a clarifying, please don't hesitate to ask because no, it sure. would matter for our interpretation. Sure. Okay. So what uh, happened uh, in this earlier study that um, Bandera et al carried out was looking at the average effect of this program. So once again, the analogy I gave, think of uh, say, a cohort of students 
and uh, we have some existing distribution of the assets they own, for example, laptops and other electronic things that might be relevant to their productivity. And then we have a program in which half of them are given, say, a, a, a kind of you know advanced laptop, a state-of-the-art uh, device, and the other half is just being studied, right? And we just want to look at what is the average impact. That is the first thing that you want to study, and this is what the earlier paper looked at. And they find that there has been a significant positive effect among the uh, treatment group after the transfer, four years after the transfer. They devote a lot more time to livestock rearing, less time to agricultural laborer, right? Overall, there is a net positive effect on hours worked and days worked and uh, suggesting that poor women earlier had idle work capacity that was not being utilized because of lack of complementary assets. Okay, so that was kind of uh, the finding of the existing uh, paper or the earlier paper. Now, one of the interesting things, in fact, it's pretty striking, is if you look at um, uh, the second bullet point, four years after the transfer, the ultra poor in treatment villages have more than four times the amount of savings and they were more likely to receive and give loans to other households. So this comparison is with respect to the control group who did not receive the transfer. So among comparable groups, those who got an asset transfer, they were generating enough income and saving more out of this income. That was nearly four times the amount of the savings of the other group, okay? Now I want to come to the core thing that this is the average effect, but for some, this was not enough and they fall back uh, and, and, and to a lower level, earlier level or close to earlier levels of capital stock. And this is where we want to sort of test what I uh, motivated this talk to start with as to what was the, uh, whether the, there was a role of the initial endowment, because otherwise, if you take a more standard convergence kind of mechanism, uh, you would not, um, um, uh, you, you would expect a certain accumulation behavior. But if you have a poverty type mechanism at work, you will observe a different accumulation behavior. And that's our main exhibit, okay? And after that, I will, of course, stop and, and, and then take any questions that, um, that might come up. So basically, what we, uh, what we kind of want to do is the following, that suppose we have this uh, KT here and KT plus one, and this is the theoretical diagram that, would, uh, uh, that we have from an earlier setup where we had convergence, right? Um, that's a kind of uh, well-behaved uh, transition equation. Now, this is what we empirically find, okay? So this diagram is gonna be important. So I want to spend the next few minutes really talking about this diagram and this is a blown up version of it, okay? So let me first show the blown up version and then I'll come back to the earlier one where it's been contrasted with the theoretical one. So once again, like with those bimodal things, let me be very clear about what these graphs are capturing. So first of all, the axis. So on the horizontal axis, you have baseline productive assets post-transfer, okay? So this is in log scale. So these are money values converted into log scale. And this is baseline productive assets post-transfer. So suppose you had K0 initially, what we have on the horizontal axis is log of K0 plus delta to relate it to the theoretical notation we developed earlier, yeah? So that's all there is, okay? Who are we looking at? And again, for your interpretation out of it, do pay careful attention to what I'm saying because otherwise uh, it is not, will not be uh, uh, straightforward interpreting it. We are only and only looking at the treatment group here. These are the people who got the asset. We know their initial assets, right? And on the horizontal axis, we are basically having the baseline productive assets post transfer log value of it, yeah? Now what we have on the vertical axis is productive assets in 2011. Yeah. So if you look back at what we had done earlier, right? So in the theoretical diagram, so on the horizontal axis, we have K0, right? And on the vertical axis, we have K1, right? This would be the theoretical counterpart to that, that, uh, that exercise. And this is what we see. If you now look at this, uh, this particular non-parametric way we estimate, and this is a real curve we are estimating. We are literally plotting the baseline productive assets post transfer, the log value of it, and productive assets in 2011, the log value of it, and basically fitting uh, this, uh, estimating this non-parametrically. 
What we see here, the behavior in terms of the initial asset level and the relationship between what you have seems to display exactly the kind of non-convexity that the earlier curves indicated. Namely, if you seem to have a bit more than this threshold level of capital and this dashed line uh, exactly simulates a, a, a 45 degree line, okay? And the reason it's not appearing like that is because the axes are not exactly symmetric here, okay? So what you can see is those who had above this initial level, threshold level of capital actually had higher levels of capital in, K, uh, in, in period uh, 2011. So this was their initial, they actually grew. And those who had below actually had less. They had some initial bump, but after that, they actually had less, okay? And that is kind of the main finding in terms of, this is what you would expect if I now go back to my theoretical diagrams. See, look at these two curves. This is what would happen if you had a, a kind of convergence type setup, right? And this is what you would have if you have some kind of non-convexities where you will have that basically, if you're below a certain level, right? And I'm gonna come back now to the empirical diagram. You're gonna fall. If you're above a certain level, you're gonna rise. And then if you're of course above a very high level, then you're again gonna fall and kind of, you know, this would therefore be a stable steady state. Of course, this is a non-parametric estimation. We can also uh, use a parametric estimation of, of, of uh, this, uh, this particular relationship between K1 and uh, K0, right? And K0 uh, taking into account the transfer that was given, yeah? And basically what we have is a curve that would be fitted like this. So it is this, the underlying, the dark blue one is the non-parametric one and this one is a polynomial of degree three, okay? So we can also look at what happened to the control group, right? We can also look at their behavior during this period, okay? And if you look at uh, their productive assets in 2007, once again, the log scale, and see here the log scale is generally lower because you have those guys uh, did not have an asset transfer and therefore in the horizontal axis, we are not looking at assets, initial assets plus the transfer. And if you look at productive assets in 2011, this transition uh, kind of behavior, right? I mean, if you just map K1 to K0, uh, resembles more the standard kind of convergence type behavior, right? That uh, you basically have some kind of a steady state around this point. So that really is our main finding. We uh, have a number of regression exercises, which I'm gonna show you, okay? I'll have to skip some of the details, but let me show you some of the regressions we run and then do a lot of robustness checks and, 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 and uh, testing for uh, unobserved productivity, et cetera. I will not have the time to go through all of that, but let's, let me at least present the core regression result. So what we have is here, we again run this regression based on uh, the, this, the first panel, uh, the first column is the treatment group. We are all the uh, observations are from the treatment group. The second column refers to the control group. And the third one has both the control and the treatment group, okay? So if you just look at the treatment and control group, we are running the same regression, namely, is it the case that their capital stock in period uh, 2011, right, is positively related to whether their initial capital stock plus the transfer exceeded this K hat that we empirically estimated earlier, non-parametrically, right? And we can see for the treatment group, there is a positive uh, relationship. So that is a confirmation of what we saw in the diagram. In the control group, there is no significant relationship as you would expect. And when you put in both the control and the treatment group, once again, you have a significant positive effect if you interact a treatment dummy with the fact that whether they were above the threshold or not, okay? So basically this is our uh, kind of core finding in terms of what is happening to the treatment group and what is happening to the control group. And it addresses one of the uh, problems that you could think of in terms of what we do here uh, in, uh, in identifying the effect of this transfer. 
that you could argue that, hey, during this period, lots of things could be going on. So even maybe uh, export uh, opportunities would change, that would change the wages, et cetera. So is it the case that the control groups were also displaying a similar accumulation behavior? And therefore, maybe this particular asset transfer program did not have the estimated effects that we are attributing it to. And clearly what I'm showing here is a, a confirmation that something is certain happening to the uh, treatment group and that is not happening to the control group. Okay, so I think, uh, so uh, am I, uh, how am I doing in terms of time? So according to my calculation, I, I, I'm nearly done, but uh, maybe Shonok, you can alert me to the time. Sure, uh, uh, you can uh, take about uh, five to 10 minutes, uh, like uh, as you- please. That's okay. So I think in fact, uh, given, given uh, the questions that could be coming, Mm -hmm. I would possibly like to wrap up in five minutes and then basically go to whichever section would be more profitable, given the kind of questions that um, that uh, that would come up, including what uh, what Shomesh asked earlier. Sure. Okay. So what we do in the rest of the paper is kind of look at a number of ways of establishing this kind of core discontinuity that we see in the control group uh, in the treatment group as compared to the control group. But next, there's a whole section of the paper where we deal with the following issue, that you could argue that, hey, what we observe in these control and treatment groups is their initial capital level, right? But we don't necessarily observe their productivity. We don't necessarily observe their saving behavior or saving propensity. And maybe there's heterogeneity there. So how do we take into account the fact that there is heterogeneity and maybe the pattern of evidence that we are seeing is consistent with a non-poverty trap model, but where heterogeneities play a big role. So again, I don't want to cram uh, a lot of uh, fairly dense work we do here in, in, in a short time to leave you perhaps more puzzled, but let me give you a qualitative summary of what, of what we do. The qualitative summary of what we do here is allow for the following. Because we can track these individuals, both control and treatment over a long period, we can actually estimate their productivities as well as their saving uh, rates quite, uh, uh, quite um, you know, well, right? So therefore, the nice thing about having a data set like this is that you can actually, you actually have a measure of whatever their observed characteristics are in certain dimensions, right? Such as saving and productivity, et cetera. Then, we can use the theory model to argue the following, and which is pretty intuitive, namely, the higher is your productivity or the higher is your saving propensity. You know, some people are just more forward looking, they're more entrepreneurial, they're more dynamic, right? The lower will be the threshold to cross. Yeah, so once again, think about the following, you know, exercise. Uh, suppose there's this slide, very slippery slide in a park. And suppose we do that experiment, maybe not with kids, maybe that's not the most responsible uh, thing to do uh, with, with uh, kids, but suppose all of us participate in this thing that we run fast and then try to see whether we can run up to the very top or some of us maybe will only reach to the middle and then maybe slide down, right? So if you use that as an analogy, then the basic poverty traps theory is the further you are away from this slide or slip, uh, as it's called in India, uh, you're more likely to fall because you're not going to get an enough enough tra traction. Whereas if you're, you know, if you, if you just exactly get a critical amount of running distance, you might actually be able to overcome the point at which you go about, right? So here the analogy to unobserved productivity or unobserved saving rates would be some people just run faster. So whatever is the distance, some people just can run very quick. They can generate more acceleration. And maybe they will be able to overcome this uh, uh, barrier more easily. So what we do is we estimate this different thresholds for high productivity versus low productivity, livestock uh, farmers among these women, as well as high saving propensity and low saving propensity, and then run a similar regression to what we ran before, but allowing for this difference. And once again, we find very similar behavior in terms of the threshold effect. So that's kind of the core exhibit uh, of this section of the paper. Anyway, so let me look at the time. So I would... Uh, uh, let yeah, sorry, is somebody trying to st uh, speak? Oh. 
I, I guess, no, no, I, I guess not. I think it might have been just a glitch in connection. That's okay. So let me uh, kind of wrap this up because there's a number of things. I have, I think, about 140 slides, uh, which, uh, <laughs> which would be, for, uh, even for a regular length seminar, would, would be a, a, a little uh, ambitious. But here, let me get to a few policy-related observations, okay? Like, as we, you know, as we know, um, uh, sort of, you know, in the end, uh, for development economics, for a lot of these programs, the motivation for this uh, study, of course, was uh, in a way testing for poverty trap mechanisms, which, which is an academic exercise. But in the end, we are interested in policy implications. Okay, So this may be, of course, of interest uh, to us as, as academic economists as to whether poverty trap mechanisms are in operation. But is it the case that um, you know, that would change our view about policy? So I will just conclude with the following thought. What this poverty trap type mechanisms or their presence implies that interventions are going to have small effects. To have a substantial effect in terms of dent on poverty, you would need the intervention to be somewhat substantial, right? Now to a non-economist might think that it's almost sounds tautological, but it's not tautological. All this says is suppose you have a budget of X crore rupees. Yeah. If you divide it up equally in small chunks and give it to a lot of poor, yeah, what this is saying is you're going to be helping. You know, everything helps if you're, especially if you're very poor at that stage, everything helps, right? But it's not going to make them, help them overcome uh, poverty in any substantive way. It would be more of a temporary relief, yeah? To have a more substantive dent on it, you might be better off giving larger chunks to a smaller group of people. So that is the bit of the policy implication that is not trivial at all. It doesn't follow from the definition, right? And moreover, it's not necessarily politically also very palatable because think about some of the trade-offs that would imply that if you have a certain budget and see, even within families, we know, and this is something we can all, I'm sure we know of um, stories or experiences or anecdotes. Suppose you're from a very poor family. Suppose you cannot send all the children to school. Often they have to make tough choices, right? In terms of, of the uh, amount, indivisible amount of uh, money that I need to get my child a good education, often that would go to one child or two child. And especially sometimes, you know, in the case of women, typically, they would get the brunt of not being, you know, receiving this, right? So some of these tough trade-offs, of course, are often uh, have to be carried out. But also, I would end with the following thought. One of the things that I always find a bit um, uh, um, kind of puzzling and, 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 and frankly, uh, not very helpful in our policy debates is, see, like the human health, there are various kinds of ailments. So if you think of poverty as a form in which it's a form of economic ill health, it is an ill health that is preventing people from reaching their full economic potential, if we define or think of poverty in that way. There are many ailments that could cause poverty, right? And we don't have to necessarily take a stance as to as much as there are many health uh, problems that our you know, human bodies face, right? So therefore, the moment I present it, I often hear the reaction. So is that the one policy you're advocating? I said, never. As with human health intervention, it would very much depend on the whole range of ailments people are facing, right? And therefore, it would very much depend on what is the particular critical ailment a particular group is facing, right? Before having a blanket one size fits policy or a magic bullet that if you do this, you will just reach the perfect uh, state. So therefore, I would say therefore for certain kinds of uh, persistent poverty, this is a good policy if one can afford it, but the underlying trade-offs and choices are as I pointed out. Anyway, I'll stop here. At this point, I would request if anybody in the audience has questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and pose your question directly to the speaker. Uh, Maitresh, amazing clarity. Uh, I'm sure uh, my colleagues uh, Shoini and Sharani, who have expertise in growth and development, they have more to say. But uh, uh, as I was referring to that diagram, uh, sure. it's all about that uh, uh, 
that uh, critical level of capital uh, which is important so uh, i was saying that think of a class which has uh, relatively you know uh, uh, you know st students with modest background then there are students who are mediocre then there are students uh, who are quite good and so you need to define what sort of education should be given that threshold uh, is important so uh, my question relates to uh, how did you get that threshold level uh, one and second is something uh, i want to go back to this gunar mirdal prebesh and uh, narkses theory were critical of uh, the development and the the trade in the A asian uh, economies so um, uh, the question is how to break this persistence of poverty uh, so that comes to the policy part so i have one technical one how did you get that threshold level or in terms of this class how to give that level of education so everyone moves up the ladder whether it's the one with the modest background the one mediocre the one who is already good uh, so sure. Yeah. So first of all, uh, yeah, both are both are uh, uh, relevant and 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 good questions uh, that kind of uh, come naturally out of uh, the topics or the issues that came up. So about the first, uh, this would be kind of my uh, general answer. So sh see, uh, this program was designed by BRAC with financial collaboration with DFID back in two thousand five, right? And uh, Fazli Abed, who's the head of BRAC. You know, it's a bit like, um, so therefore uh, just, and this is not undue modesty, it's just correcting the record. I had nothing to do with it, okay? So it's a bit like, if I study Grameen Bank's microfinance, it's like, how did Muhammad Yunus come up with that $100 or $200 or whatever amount that, so it's a valid question as to how did BRAC come up with this number? So your question is a valid one, but we had nothing to do with it. I mean, you know, certainly not me and certainly not my co-authors also, but, so there are two parts to your question. One is how do you figure out the threshold, okay? So this, if you think about it, this is very hard. So even right now, uh, I, uh, we, all of us are facing a pandemic and that's one of those common global shocks everybody is facing, right? So how do we know that which uh, vaccine would work well and whether you would need a booster, you know, with people with existing conditions, what will happen? So this is a very profound, problem of any intervention, because the success of an intervention may depend on certain uh, behavior of general behavior, right? Whether, you know, more is good or it's good, but at diminishing rate, et cetera, versus those who have a family history of heart disease, those who have a lung condition, for them, this would be different. So what I'm drawing here is the medical analogy. So you're exactly right that if we want to do it with the uh, students here, right? So think about, um, you know, IIT students or or maybe IIT students are likely to be selected to be such that, you know, they are there for perhaps, um, you know, but think about a college where you have students coming from very, very different backgrounds, right? And with a certain distribution of ability and potential, yeah? So wow. now, of course, suppose again, theoretically, let's think about these are independent that we, we just don't know. Uh, you know, you have high or low quality in terms of, you know, ability or potential, and you also come from rich or poor background. And let's assume it's, you know, um, uh, sort of, you know, the two things are independently distributed, which doesn't have to be, but for, for our, our... So see, given the nature of this data set, all we know is a laptop was given, if I, if I draw the analogy. So in this setting, it's a rural setting, livestock, you know, poor women. So that was a cow, largely in this urban educated setting. So all I know was say a Dell laptop or a MacBook was given. And then I'm basically looking at, are these guys you know, going on to accumulate more such capital, right? I mean, you know, or do they are selling off their thing and maybe doing some chota mota sort of you know, thing, right? So that, that, is, that would be the analogy. So beyond that, there's not much we can infer from this because exposed, the intervention was one and only one. So, that's why we have to go about a bit indirectly as to estimate their differential productivity, estimate their differential saving behavior, and see if the thresholds could be lower or higher. That's why we go through those exercises as to how much role heterogeneity is placing. That's one. 
But your second question, which is maybe one part B, is a really good one because see how did Brack figure it out? So clearly, you know, I mean, why, why? And the thing is in the end, I think sometimes nature offers solutions which are humanized then have to, you know, do a lot of theorizing to figure out at the risk of uh, sounding a, a bit facetious, but I actually mean it as because cows are indivisible. Cows only come with four legs and a full body. It's an indivisible thing. It's like a car. You can't get a two thirds of a car. In principle, you can, because you can share. Two students can share a car or share a say motorbike or something, right? But therefore, uh, going back to your question, Somesh, they must have done enough billet service. This is what I know from the indirect kind of evidence I have from those guys as to what was the modal occupation among the more affluent of the women on those villages. And that tend to be livestock farming, right? And then that value is just the value of a cow, right? So, and the cow comes in this indivisible unit. If it was more flexible size of capital, then your point would be much more that how do you throw a dart and you hit it exactly right? How did, you know, how did they figure out, right? So therefore that would be kind of part B of your question. So remind me a bit about your second question. So I think I've answered the uh, one party and part B. So remind me the second question. Yeah, just uh, going back to the 60s, where uh, Professor oh, right, right. Gunnar Mirdal and Nurkse and Prebis Singha were very critical of the development uh, process in the developing nations. So I, I was just thinking that how to break this persistence of poverty, is it ICT? Is it clustering, agglomeration? Come, I mean, uh, the policy things that you were talking about or making internet cheaper or something, I mean, that way. No, no, fine. No, no, absolutely. So see, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a very uh, kind of big picture question, but one uh, that kind of comes naturally if you, if you reflect on these set of uh, issues or programs. So first of all, we should distinguish macro and micro, right? So clearly something trade as a mechanism of, as an engine of growth, right? And then you have the Prebish Sengar come, you know, uh, um, uh, all those guys about Emmanuel Wallerstein, Andre Gunder Frank, all these guys who are saying maybe even the trade process is hopelessly biased against developing countries, primary exporting developing countries versus, you know, industrial goods, the kind of stuff that happened during the colonial times with the British dumping manufacturing and kind of thereby undermining Indian uh, artisan things, whatever, right? So even trade opening is not a mechanical uh, a guarantee for success, but surely there are macro factors. And if you look at China or East Asia more broadly, or even our neighboring Bangladesh, which have been successful in cotton textile kind of exports, uh, so has been Sri Lanka. So, uh, so surely trade has a role to play. And therefore, like I gave the analogy of the human body, so clearly having more uh, less pollution in the environment or better roads can only help, right? So similarly, having a better trade regime where we have more demand for our export goods, that would induce demand for unskilled labor as well as skilled labor. Their children can then go to school, that kind of stuff. So that mechanism, certainly I would, you know, if, if you take a holistic view, one can never be opposed to that because in the end, you need a whole range of uh, exercises or policies uh, to do that. So clearly that, that macro level stuff. Second, right, you rightly pointed out the agglomeration type things, right? There's a reason why, you know, say Bombay is, is what it is or Calcutta is it what it is and Delhi is what it is. Uh, but then you have smaller towns, which, which kind of, you know, so urban agglomeration is one example, industrial complexes or industrial clusters grow up, etc. And once again, they display these kind of um, uh, positive feedback or self-reinforcing feedback, right, which may be, uh, which, uh, which is very, so again, I would say those macro policies are certainly complementary with some of the stuff we are talking about, just to give an example, very concrete example, suppose milk was not so perishable, or there was a milk processing plant near these Bangladeshi villages, and you could immediately export this milk to say medium or higher income countries. Whatever this program evaluated, right? Immediately it would have done better because the prices or the returns that these women then would get from their livestock dairy thing would be much better, right? So therefore this shows the complementary between uh, complementarity between these asset transfer programs and macro level policies 
such as trade and exports, et cetera. So, okay, so I will you know, kind of stop here, but if you look at the paper at, at your leisure, you'll see we do get into, so therefore this is a much more narrow thing. It's like, okay, I'm just gonna look at your kidney issues. It is not to say you should not have better diet, you should have better you know, uh, air to breathe in, all those things. So just for, if you have a certain budget for transfer, then my general view, and I've written a fair bit on universal basic income, et cetera, even in the Indian context. So my view is we have to take into account two views of poverty. One is poverty as pain relief. That somebody who's very hungry, even if you can manage to give this person 100 rupees, that is helpful because that may be what is preventing this person from you know, having a meal or feeding his or her family versus not, right? But we should not have any illusion that this will have any medium or long-term effect because you're literally, it is a more like a immediate relief kind of thing. So this is where I would say what our paper is suggesting that if you're gonna have transfer programs, make it more substantial or distribute it more equally so to distribute the relief more equally because otherwise, you would need a bit of a big push for people to get out of the traps they seem to be in. Anyway, I've, I, you know, perhaps there are other questions, but thanks for uh, these questions and hopefully I've addressed them. Thank you. So Professor Ghatak, I had a question oh, and uh, yeah. my question is, so what, uh, if I understand, oh, no, uh, if, you do, if you don't mind, if you turn on the camera, it's just yeah. easier uh, if sure, you emulate sure. more, uh, you know, regular interaction. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. So. So. Yeah, uh, Shonak, uh, can you? Uh, 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 that screen uh, because then we can see everyone. You can exactly. Stop that sharing. would be kind of nice yeah. if, okay. if, if you don't mind uh, if you switch on your camera. That yeah. Yeah. Stop us and you can stop sharing because that. Yeah. Way yeah. Okay. I, I, think... I, will, I will stop that. Yeah. Yeah, I've stopped the sharing. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so if I understood you correctly, what you showed us is that there was a threshold above which people who were given who were given the asset transfer they had KT plus one greater than KT, and uh, and below the threshold people had KT plus one less than KT. And I was wondering, like, if it might be possible to follow these people through, say, some further periods of time to see actually whether the people who have KT plus one get greater than KT are actually converging. So we have, so I didn't have the time to present it, but uh, we have some more uh, evidence on the long-term impact of this transfer. So if you go to my website, I don't have, I, I may even have the slides, but there wouldn't be enough time to go through it carefully. So yes, it is true that they are converging to some kind of um, intermediate level, which brings us maybe to some of the questions that Shomesh had asked, namely, what next? So you have pulled these people from very ordinary agricultural labor type things, which has uncertain and low returns. So this is better, but then th that's where they are. It's not you know, causing any radical changes in their cost, you know, a standard of living. You know, it is positive, and so therefore, what would be other interventions, et cetera. But yes, there is evidence that they kind of plateau out. It's not like they're starting the mother dairy uh, or, or Amul type thing. And I, I say this again, it's not meant to be a funny thing because it, indeed you wanna ask that what is preventing some of these you know, women uh, to kind of you know, go, get together and form some kind of a, mm -hmm. either cooperative or some kind of a milk processing unit, which would uh, have economies of scale. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, dear, hello, I'm Sharuni. Uh, hi. Hi. So do you also have any, uh, uh, maybe you have it in your paper, I haven't read it. So do you have any other, uh, like, so you have showed it like for the threshold, but I was thinking that are there any other individual variables for which, you know, some, some characteristics of women below the threshold who, who will get this, who, who will go to, who, who will uh, show this type of behavior rather uh, than for some other, like, like in terms of say uh, some, uh, like how autonomous women are or age, or I mean, some individual. Yeah, so, 
Right. So yeah, so uh, Sharani, if you, if you could turn your camera on, I, again, it's not essential, but it's always helpful. Otherwise, I, I'm just uh, looking at a blank screen. So it's e e easy. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so yeah, going back to your question. So see, we, we are limited but by what our sample, uh, sample uh, allows, right? And there are a number of characteristics, like you mentioned, whether it's autonomy, uh, you know, whether it's a female headed household versus whether the, you know, uh, the husband uh, is around or whether this guy's a migrant worker and so on. So bottom line is that age does play a factor. There is a life cycle element. And for some of these women, especially when their children get married, uh, we see that their assets are changing. So there's a life cycle thing. So you, you go up to a point, but when you uh, marry off uh, either your son or daughter, right? But beyond that, uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, so this uh, maybe is uh, the kind of philosophy of research. This paper is really testing for poverty traps. And we do look at the alternative roles of saving rates and productivity, right? And some aspects of age. But, you know, it, clearly in any empirical setting, there are one million factors you could take into account, right? Including uh, the role of uh, certain social norms in these villages, how strong the social networks are and so on. So I would say we only focus on a few of these. So that's a, that's a good question, but as you can imagine that within the scope of this research, we are just interested in this indivisibility behavior based on asset ownership. And that is really the main thing. And there are many other things one could in principle look at. Thank you. Maitresh, we have Debayan also who has worked extensively on Bangladesh and he has a paper in JDE. Debayan, uh, would you like to? Yeah, hello, hi. Uh, hi, no, Debayan, could you turn the camera on? Sorry yeah. to, sorry to be, yeah, <laughs> if, if it's difficult, then don't, but never mind. Yeah, actually, yeah, I can, yeah. I'm, hello, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, it's just useful to see somebody's face when answering a question, yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, like I have no particular comments. I am also, uh, uh, for my PhD thesis, I have also worked on poverty traps. And, but uh, in that, in not in this respect, my was more about uh, technology trap and how uh, certain countries uh, actually um, takeoffs and others don't at a particular time. So it was more about takeoffs, landing, and the role of technology uh, trap in that respect. So yeah, I really enjoyed your talk as I have no particular comments. No problem. Good luck with your work. I, I always enjoy your paper. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And we have so, uh, so many students, uh, yeah. students wish to pose a question. Shohini is also here. Please go ahead. Please don't hesitate. You know, I will. I will um, um, address uh, your question, and, and no question is unimportant enough. They did ask me, but secretly, that are you a student of Professor Banerjee? Yeah, I am one of his, uh, uh, if you look at uh, uh, Abhijit Banerjee's uh, list of students, uh, his earliest two students would be me and Kaivan Munshi. So I, uh, yeah, so Abhijit uh, and I have a well-known paper on tenancy on Operation Borga in West yeah. Bengal. Yeah. So that's joint work with Abhijit and I have several other papers with him. So absolutely, he was, my co-supervisor before even becoming, um, you know, a senior faculty. So it was while I was in graduate school that then he got his first position at MIT, and of course now he's a household name for uh, for since 2019. But yes, he's a friend and a mentor for a, for a long time. Interestingly, and I, I don't, you know, this is all funny because at the time when I became their student, they were all, of course, uh, stalwarts, but one wouldn't be able to foresee these things. My main supervisor was Eric Maskin. Uh, and uh, he, he, he sort of, and who was Abhijit's supervisor too. So, uh, uh, and of course, Eric uh, also won, won a Nobel Prize in 2008. Uh, but yeah, I, I graduated in the late 90s. So this was well before. In fact, Amata Sen was a teacher. I wasn't his, you know, I took his course 
but I was he was not in my committee or whatever. But yes, I uh, Amartya Sen got his uh, Nobel Prize in '98. Uh, so anyway, so that's uh, yeah, it's always uh, very very um, uh, you know rewarding and 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 satisfying when uh, you, you you get to work with such stalwarts. So uh, I had a question about the policy implications. Sure. And uh, so I was wondering, so given that we have a trap set up, so in terms of uh, targeting transfers, would it not be a good idea to target, if we could, to target people who are just below the threshold, then a little transfer would get them above the threshold and they would converge the good steady state? Yeah, that's a, that's a valid and, and good point. Uh, except for the following problem happens. Econometrically, given what we are doing, we are so thankful that they didn't do that because that would destroy the exogeneity. If the target is based mm -hmm. on ability, right, then, or whatever else, right, then it's not again clear econometrically how are we going to identify these thresholds, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so like a lot of exogenous shocks that people use in empirical work, it is better that they are kind of blunt shocks that they are, that are not too uh, tailored to individual characteristics or regional characteristics. But yes, if you are a planner or a policymaker, mm -hmm. you would exactly want to uh, you know, uh, distribute uh, this differentially. But having said that, see, we, you know, as, as, as people, uh, you know, Bella Balasa mm -hmm. is the one who is supposedly have said this, every economic problem we solve is a solved political problem. And the reason I raise it is the following. You know, think about it, right? I mean, optimal mechanism. That assumes there is no mob roving around and taking away people's property and stuff. So you have to assume a certain institutional framework before we can design optimal policies and mechanisms, okay? So coming to what you're saying, leaving aside the political issue, there are ethical concerns, and that is something that have plagued the RCT uh, uh, whole paradigm, right? Because there's a sense in which, suppose you have a bunch of very hungry people, yeah? Uh, how do you it, right? I mean, things, who is going to get the program versus who is not going to get the program, right? Mm -hmm. And if you tailor it, right? Uh, suppose uh, students who are more promising, you give them the laptop, and who are less promising, you don't give it. There are equity considerations that you would then bump into. So that you know, the, the, it, it, so again, uh, I, I always feel that in the end we have to always try to have these conversations between. It's like doctors; you have to figure out what is the technical aspects of a medic medic medicine or treatment. So that is a technical thing, and for that, the more random the distribution, the better for me because I can then tease out what is happening, right? But then the whole ethics issue comes up, right? I mean, who, what are you basing the experiment on? Who are you giving it to and not, right? Even with the vaccine, right? Who gets mm -hmm. it first, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. And third, of course, is the political will and, and political uh, kind of economy of this. So suppose elections are coming up, you know, how are you gonna allocate the transfer program? You're gonna give it to constituencies that are tighter in terms of the votes and so on. So both the economic side of it then the kind of equity or social welfare side of it, and then the political economy of it, they will always be at, at work together. And there's no easy answer. I, you know, certainly I don't have any, but I don't believe there are any easy answers. Okay, thank you. And that's a very insightful response. I mean, thinking about so many things and, and one needs to think of them in, 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 in one, I mean, as an integrated, I mean, integrate the, the different aspects of policy making. I mean, policy making is always more complicated than our models would. I mean, than we would want to compare, conclude based on just our models. So, exactly. Right. Exactly. So do we have a question for uh, Professor Ghatak from uh, some of our PhD students who are here?
looks like uh, we have run through the course of questions so okay so if there are uh, no further questions uh, we take this opportunity professor Khatta, to thank you one more time for sparing um, so much of your valuable time and talking to us taking uh, the time to talk to us and share your insights. It was indeed a very insightful presentation and empirical evidence on a topic which we have read about so much, but as you rightly mentioned, empirical evidence is hard to come by for precisely uh, the very reasons that uh, you described. It would be great to uh, go over your paper and I will certainly do it. Uh, we, many of us, in fact, would want to read the paper and to understand more of the details and the insights it has for uh, policy. Um, uh, Professor Mathur, would you want to add something? No, uh, Shaunak, uh, do uh, get the mailing address of yeah, sure. Professor Maitresh. And uh, we are thrilled, actually, uh, to have you here. And we mm -hmm. hope that the association will not just stop with this. And uh, the, at least the communication will go on. And uh, uh, we are, of course, Facebook friends. I don't know. <laughs> he knows it. Yeah, yeah. yeah but uh, surely uh, we, we want to have uh, a longer association. Absolutely. No, thank you for inviting me. And, and, and of course, um, you know, uh, uh, when we growing up, you know, IITs, I don't know when the economics department started, but I, I, we always have, because I didn't go through the engineering track. So we always had this, uh, the other track, right? The kind of ones that say Raghurajan and others did. So IIT uh, Kanpur, I, I know of many graduates there who are all gone on to very, very distinguished careers. So I'm very happy now that uh, I, I think all of them have now social science units and e economics, et cetera. And so, yeah, thanks for having me. I always, any, any, any um, sort of um, Indian institution in which there is sort of you know uh, interest and 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 work going on, I'm always happy as a, as a, as a, as an NRI to uh, chip in and 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 participate and 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 be uh, involved in in any way I can. Um, so uh, I I think our our uh, human capital is something that I I'm still amazed at the kind of students that uh, always come up. It's genuinely very very uh, um, sort of nice to see the generations of students who who come out. So, uh, so yes, Somesh, I'll be, will definitely be in touch, and and yeah. so uh, and and uh, will be happy, uh, you know, uh, to continue our our uh, conversation. Sure. And so once we are done with COVID and all of this, once we are a bit more back to normalcy, it would be great to, uh, if you could when you visit India, like if you could. Um, visit us, it would be really great. So we would... Uh, I'll be happy to, yeah. No, I do go to India very regularly and this is the only time in my life I'm sort of stuck here and doesn't, it's a bit uh, 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 unfortunate, but yes, no, I, I, I go uh, several times a year and hopefully it will resume sometime soon. Yeah. Okay, very good. Uh, thank, thank you, thank you so again much. for having me. Thanks for your comments and, and your uh, interest in this. And let's be in touch. All right. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye bye. bye.